I see one of our speakers. Hi, Chris. DC is here, so we are two thirds of the way there. Lauren, we have a quorum, uh, well over a quorum. We have the folks who I was expecting who would be speaking later. So I think you could commence at any time. Um, thank you, Dean. Hi, everyone. Um, and welcome to the May 3rd, 2023, Mississauga Bay Basin Water Quality Council meeting. Um, Happy May. Happy May. So, um, thank you. Um, as per usual, if we don't mind doing a quick um, round of introductions, I will call on folks to introduce yourselves. I'm Lauren Westinge with the uh, Franklin County Natural Resources Conservation District. Um, and I am the basin chair and I'm also a voting member and I'm gonna try to change my um, text to say that. Uh, Dan, would you like to go next? Sorry, Dan, you are muted. Uh, Dan Sheely, third voting member. Thank you, Dan. Sarah. Sarah Downs, Enosburg, voting member. Kent. And Henderson, Friends of Northern Lake Champlain, voting member. Beth. NBPA voting member. Lindsay. Lindsay White, Mississippi River Basin Association, Upper Mississippi and Trout Rivers Wild and Scenic Committee, Vice Chair and voting member. Uh, Alaire. Um, Alaire Diamond from Vermont Land Trust and I'm a voting member. Um, Dave Allerton. Oh. Dave, for some reason we still can't hear you. All right, sorry, David. Um, Ted. Ted Sedell, uh, Orleans County Natural Cons Resource Conservation District, voting member. Awesome, Tom. Tom Brizzledon, Friends of Northern Lake Champlain, um, alternate. Ellen. Uh, the Missisquoi River Basin Association, and I'm an alternate. Um, all right, Chris. 
Hey folks, thanks for having me at your meeting. Um, I'm Chris Rottler. I'm with the state with DEC and I'm the clean water service provider coordinator. And uh, I don't know if I've met hardly any of you. So I'm really glad that I'm here uh, to put a face to a name and be able to just uh, be a fly on the wall for your meeting and, and to be a resource for you as you're doing all the good work that you're doing here in your basin. So thanks, I wanna say thanks for signing on to this crazy process. And, uh, and uh, we very much appreciate what you're doing here. So nice to meet all of you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Stacy, you're here. Hi, I am. I, I apologize. I don't have a camera today. I forgot it in Essex yesterday. So um, I am Stacy Pomeroy. I'm the river scientist uh, for this region of the state. Thanks, Stacey. Daya. Hi, everyone. I'm Daya with staff. Um, Patrick. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Patrick Ross, uh, VTrans hydraulic engineer. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I got everybody besides Dean. Please yell at me if I'm wrong. All right, I'm Dean, Dean, go ahead. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'm, I think most people know me. I'm Dean here with staff. Wonderful. All right. Thanks everybody for being here. I know it's a busy time. I stepped away from 12,000 trees to be here. So it's nice to see people instead of trees and dirt. All right. Um, review the meeting protocol. Thank you very much. Um, once again, just try to engage as much as possible. Um, raise your hand if you'd like to speak, and we'll go in order. Um, when it's time to vote, we'll we'll do our hand voting, and I'll call on everyone just to make sure that things are counted. And if you do put a comment in the chat, we will read it aloud for pu the public record. All right. Thank you, Dean. So we can review the agenda. Oops. And please let me know if anyone has anything to add or change or questions. All right, seeing none. Um, oh, yes, Patrick. Sorry, I'm not used to Zoom. I just wondered <laughs> if um, I just got done a two hour meeting and I apologize, but. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any way we could move up the cult, the covert issue um, so that I don't have to stay on for a full two hours. And I, I apologize if that's selfish of me, but um, I don't know if I can take another two hour meeting. Certainly. Um, I will say the culvert is definitely the first actual um, topic we'll get to. So that should be within okay. the next five minutes, if not sooner. Okay, um, thank it, you. I know it looks further down. But yes, uh, and can completely appreciate not wanting to be on another two hour call. All righty. Any other uh, comments on the agenda? All right. Seeing none, we will move on to the actual agenda the approval of our minutes from the last meeting. And to approve the minutes as written. Here, a motion from Lindsay. Thank you. Do you want to hear a second? This is I second. Um, I think I heard lots of seconds, so I'm going to give it to Alaire. I think I heard you first. Um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All right, I see Dan, Sarah, Kent, Lindsay, Alaire, Ted, and Lauren. Um, all those opposed? Seeing none. All those abstaining? So anyone who was not there? Um, it's like all voting members were present last time. So that makes this easy. Great, so um, motion passes. Thank you all. Thanks Daya for typing up those notes. Much appreciated. All right, any public comment not related to items on the agenda? All right, seeing none, um, we will continue onwards. Dean, do we have to seat anyone? No, okay. Even better. Great. Um, culvert issues. I'd say that was before five minutes. So 
So I'm proud of us. Go team. Uh, all right. Uh, at this point, I will gladly turn it over to you, Dean. Okay. Um, just going to show a slide or two before just letting the speakers have at it. I haven't given them too much in the way of instructions, but hopefully this can be a um, interactive session. Um, in your packets, there were some excerpts from what's called this um, CWIP funding policy, which is an important document that spells out how funding for clean water projects um, can be spent. There's an excerpt from the policy. The policy also has some appendices, and um, I've also included some materials from those. Chris will be here to address maybe some high level questions or maybe make some high level comments. He's not um, steeped in the funding policy, but will take any unanswered questions back to people in DEC who can answer them. Um, Appendix B, though, uh, as this slide shows, is a table of the projects, the different types of projects that are eligible. It's got more detail. Appendix D addresses several different topics, but it has a particular portion that provides guidance on roads and stormwater gully projects. So that's material people had in the packet and hopefully had a chance to glance at and refresh some of your memory because we have talked about the funding policy before. Um, the speakers are uh, on this slide here. It's Chris, and I thought he could go first. And Amy and Patrick could um, toss a coin. I've got Stacy listed first, but um, it's up to you, I guess. Um, what has led to this conversation uh, was a conversation that happened at the last meeting, essentially some questions that were asked that have to do with culvert type projects. And I've paraphrased the, the questions a little bit and it would be great to have a conversation that are, are, is around these questions. And they are, who is responsible for replacing culverts on different types of roads? Does Is there a law that requires culverts when they're replaced to be upsized to allow um, aquatic organism passage. That's the AOP uh, acronym that I use there. Support. Uh, apologies for not spelling that out. Um, and if there is a requirement, does it apply everywhere or to all types of roads or culverts? And then, if it's possible to talk a little bit about funding for these types of projects for culvert replacements, is there enough funding? People uh, can offer their opinions. Um, and then what's the process, if people can address that generally? And the last question that was posed was, in the view of the people offering perspectives, um, is using clean water funding uh, an appropriate thing to do for these types of projects? So that's all the introduction that I'm going to offer. And Chris, if you wouldn't mind just taking uh, things from here and offering whatever comments that you feel and then maybe uh, reiterating your offer to answer any questions um, that can't be fielded here today at a later time. Um, hey, Dean, thanks for having me. Um, I am just seeing these questions here for the first time. So I, I did not um, prepare any specific uh, presentation or in-depth uh, analysis for you. On, um, but I can say, uh, the first threshold question for the QUISP and, and the BWIC when funding any project, um, aside from looking at the funding policy, is whether it's, which is, and this question is related to the funding policy, is whether the project is regulatory or non-regulatory. And QUISP funds are only available for non-regulatory or voluntarily implemented projects. and so um, I think in answering this question about culverts, the, the threshold question is, is replacing a culvert a regulatory project or not a regulatory project? I am not a TS4 expert, um, but I know VTrans is doing some work uh, under the TS4 that are required to, to do work under the TS4, which is a 
regulatory or you know permit program for for um, VTrans to implement clean water initiatives uh, related to roadways. Um, so I don't have a specific answer to the question whether a culvert is a TS4 project or not. I think one of the issues is whether um, VTrans is doing work on a culvert and claiming it as a phosphorus credit under the TS4 um, permit, which would make it regulatory in nature. Um, but we do have a, a meeting on the books with VTrans um, that Emily Bird, the Clean Water Initiative Program Manager set up uh, in the meeting is this coming Monday. And what I can do is I can take the specific question of culverts to that meeting and I can report back to you. Um, and I'm really glad that you're diving into this level of detail. I wish I had more specific information. That's sort of my high level um, analysis for you is, you know, if, if it's non-regulatory and VTrans isn't doing the work or isn't required to do the work, then I would say, and there's a, phosphorus reduction benefit to the replacing the culvert, then I'd say then, you know, it might be something that you could look at. Um, but I'm going to need a little bit more information before we can make that call. I hope that's mildly helpful with more to come. Thanks, Chris. Um, any high level questions? Or if I can take it from here, then I would just Ask uh, Stacy, do you want to go next? Um, I think some of the questions would probably be specific that Pat can help answer. I will say from how we've evaluated culverts projects in the past for potential water quality funding is looking at the benefit of the structure on the reach and how it improves the geomorphic condition on the reach. So is it a local area that's being affected or is it having reach wide effect? Um, we've typically gone and done you know, site evaluation to see how the structure is affecting the area upstream and downstream of the structure and the benefits that it could provide by being upsized. In the past, we have not counted phosphorus credits as part of those considerations. It's been based on the, the equilibrium condition that the improved culvert could provide. That being said, culverts are in the functioning floodplain initiative tool as potential project types that could receive a phosphorus credit. Um, each site will be different based on where it is in the watershed what type of um, project it would be, whether you're just sim simply retrofitting a culvert or whether you're replacing the structure, um, is there opportunity for floodplain connection, et cetera, um, that would also contribute to what type of phosphorus credit may be received on any individual structure. But they are a, a potential project type that could receive phosphorus credits. Um, under the functioning floodplain tool, and they have been a project type that we have looked at for water quality funding in the past, um, where they can demonstrate that they're improving an equilibrium condition on the reach um, and not just localized. Um, I'll let Pat answer the question about replacing culverts, et cetera, um, but I just wanted to provide context for the discussion around phosphorus credits um, that may be of interest. Thanks, Stacy. Patrick, uh, you're on. All right. Hey, Dean, could you put the, the list on and I'll try to go through the list as best I can and, and answer your questions. Um, so I'll just go down the list and do the best I can. Um, who's responsible for replacing culverts on different types of non-private roads, uh, town roads versus state roads and other relevant classes of roads. So um, non-private roads, uh, uh, town roads are the responsibility of the municipalities. Um, and state roads are the responsibility of the state. Um, I'm not an expert in road, uh, functionality, but there are some times when a town road is actually, uh, has federal aid, 
uh, some of the main roads in certain towns, some of the class one town highways are actually federal aid highways. So they would, um, they would get funding uh, through v VTRANS for certain culverts. Um, but I think it's safe to, to say that most of the town highway structures are municipal funded. And then most all um, of the state highway structures are either state and or federally funded. Now, um, the responsibility and funding are two, two separate things. So for instance, and I don't know how far you want to get into this, but the town municipalities, there's multiple different funding sources for uh, culverts uh, and small bridges uh, that towns can take advantage of. Probably many that you, or some that you already know, one being the municipal roads general permit. There's some grant funding associated with that that comes through uh, um, VTRANS. Um, and also there's a town highway structures grant that uh, comes through the state district trans transportation offices. And that's, um, uh, that's on a, on a case by case uh, grant application by grant application. Um, and, and the funding for that uh, helps towns, municipalities replace um, uh, structures that are, are either in poor condition um, or uh, f for some other reason, the structures on, a, on the higher priority list for a town to replace. Um, and that funding is supposed to be equitably uh, administered throughout the district. So um, in your case, um, my guess is most of you would be, uh, most of the towns would be in district eight. So um, would be worth reaching out to district eight if, if you've got certain structures and find out where they might be on the project um, priority list. Uh, bullet two, does a state require AOP culverts be replaced with appropriately sized structures uh, to allow for AOP? If so, is it true for all types of roads and culverts? Um, well, there's a, so we'll break this down. Uh, um, AOT has a little bit different relationship with, uh, with the regulations. We follow uh, Title 19, which, which basically um, we're, we're exempt from uh, the stream alteration regulations. However, VTRANS is part of that Title 19 coordination with DEC River, Rivers program. Um, we... Uh, I would say typically we'll, we'll follow the same protocol as anybody else in the state in terms of like municipalities um, or any other organization that's, that's looking to uh, um, uh, change a culvert on a, on a public road. Uh, there are times when municipalities and, and, the, and VTRANS might not meet that AOP uh, uh, standard and, and, and that's in the case of say uh, an emergency uh, a, a, a retrofit what you know it might might be some of those types of issues but in general in general we always try to meet that AOP requirement um, for all of all our culverts um, and as far as I know the same thing goes for municipalities I just I just took this, I just started this job January 1st. I was with Stacy Pomeroy. I was one of the river management engineers for a number of years. And I can tell you that, uh, um, you know, again, there are some exceptions 
where um, be just because of the reach or the circumstances, you know, you might have a bedrock control and you, it, for whatever reason, you, you can't get an AOP structure in, into a pr uh, specific uh, location. But for the most part, um, AOP structures are typical uh, around the state and uh, they're part of the design process um, everywhere and at every site. Um, I, they, there are exceptions to that rule, but I would say there are a few exceptions and for the most, most part, AOP is the rule of the land. Um, and that's uh, all built into the stream alteration general permit, which is on the, uh, uh, which is can be found if you're interested on ANR DEC's website, River Management, um, and you can just uh, uh, search for uh, the stream alteration general permit. And uh, the criteria there is pretty clear. Um, bankful width um, structures are the name of the game. AOP is. Uh, is a requirement as far as that process goes. Um, most culverts in the state of Vermont now, AOT or otherwise are being embedded in the stream bed. And uh, if they're a closed bottom structure, um, they're, we're putting infill inside the structures so that they're actually mimicking a, a bridge or a natural crossing with, uh, with stone and gravel to mimic the stream bed. I hope that answers that question uh, to the best of my ability. Uh, bullet three, where does the funding come from? Okay, so the funding I've, I've, I've mentioned, is there sufficient funding to su support the law reference? Well, um, probably there's never enough money, right? I mean, nobody's got enough money in their checkbook, I, I guess. I mean, some people do, but... Um, so certainly there's always opportunities if we I've in my previous job with the rivers program, I did a lot of partnering with Trout Unlimited, uh, Connecticut River Partnership, um, those types of groups that would sponsor and help fund um, habitat restoration projects around the state. And they were um, the uh, actively engaged in, in different watersheds to try to uh, facilitate and ex expedite projects that they thought would be a benefit uh, to water quality, fisheries and AOP uh, in general. Um, and those, you know, they had private, private and public uh, uh, funding available to, to, to help uh, match other funds uh, to be able to um, do good work and 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 um, uh, put those projects uh, in the ground a lot sooner than if they were to say wait for you know the funding normal funding processes to come around. So I would say that there's there is never enough money. Um, to support all the all the projects we all want to get done on everybody's priority list, um, but we try to you know I I I advocated in my previous role that, that towns create their top ten list um, such that they when the funding came around or when it was their turn to get a town highway structures grant or they were applying for, say, a better roads, uh, MRGP, uh, better roads funding, um, that they knew where they needed to allocate that funding. So um, if you've got some funding, I would, I, would, I would say that that would be a good place to start is to see if the towns you're supporting have a, or if you guys have a priority list and then, and then try to hammer that priority list. Next bullet, what is the process for funding a culvert? Um, like I said, so based on priorities around the watershed, around a given municipality, 
generally, unfortunately, the municipalities are looking at what structures are failing um, and then kind of, you know, putting their priorities in that in that um, basket versus, you know, maybe maybe projects that might be more interested or you folks might be more interested in from a from a standpoint of, of phosphorus reduction and and um, and other things getting to the lake. Uh, so they, they may be looking at things in terms of just where their infrastructure is at is at. And if they've got a bridge or a culvert that's in, you know, a state of disrepair, that might be a pretty high uh, priority for them. Um, I'm not sure where the priority might be for the basin as a whole, but it's likely where their where their um, where their priority is is, and then they would be applying for funding, whether it be um, funding from one of these sources. The other funding I didn't mention, and probably Stacy's already thought of, is there is some uh, there's some there's some hazard mitigation funding that uh, is often available after. Um, statewide or after flood events. Um, um, and I'm probably not saying this correctly, but I, basically when there's a flood event in the state, um, there's a 15% um, mitigation fund that's set up uh, for each flood event. So if the, they'll just use easy numbers and, and, and to keep it simple, but if there's a if there's a million dollar flood, which is a very, very, very small flood, but if there's a million dollar flood in the state of Vermont, $150,000 would be placed into a bucket and then the municipalities could apply for that, um, that funding. It's, it's hazard mitigation uh, funding that, that they can also take advantage of. And there's also probably many other funds that Stacy probably could chime in on other areas and other grants that 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 folks can take advantage of that I'm not as aware of. Um, that's that's some of the funding mechanisms that I am aware of. Um, in the view of people working on the state level is using clean water funding to raise uh, appropriate. I, I I've we you know there's there's certainly when I had my other position with DEC we used clean water funding um, to do a lot of work around municipalities, as Stacy mentioned, um, you know, we would look at the reach level and where the culvert was being replaced. But generally speaking, when you're talking about replacing a very undersized culvert that oftentimes will have erosion issues associated with it in the downstream reach, usually in the immediate downstream reach, um, uh, replacing it with an AOP compatible bank full width um, flood resilient structure, um, you know that's that would would meet the um, would meet the level in my previous work for uh, clean water funding. So uh, that's the best I can speak to that, and I would I would turn it over to Stacy to fill in any of the gaps that I may have missed i'm sure she's going to be able to help me with funding for sure and other um in the clean water as well she's she's much more involved with those types of things than i am i hope that's somewhat helpful if you have specific questions i'd take them now thank you patrick yeah you you hit um a large source of the funding in the Lake Champlain Basin, we also have uh, the Lake Champlain Basin program that has <clears throat> currently has some aquatic organism passage funding. Um, they also have uh, historically looked at some structure crossings under other funding pots, but they currently have an aquatic organism passage fund um, to that. As you mentioned, Trout Unlimited uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife also provides some funding, and our Vermont Fish and Wildlife also has uh, contributed funds. Um, I will build on your discussion around funding also often comes in, in multiple packages of, um, you know, working to find the mix of funding that can support an overall project. 
um, maybe multiple sources that come to replace that structure. And that, as you mentioned, um, the town's priorities may often be where their infrastructure is in need and not necessarily where there's a culvert that's in good shape but is currently an, an aquatic organism passage need or um, may offer opportunity through improved floodplain uh, connections, um, a larger water quality benefit as well. So um, there, are, there are many opportunities where um, folks are working on other portions of the structures within a municipality that the municipality is able not to focus on because of their limited funding resources or time um, and priorities. So oftentimes partners are helping flush out other structures um, that can be a priority for clean water and aquatic organism passage. Um, as to the last question, using clean water funds, we have seen benefits to contributing clean water funds to structure replacement. As Pat noted, there can improve, you know, reducing the erosion downstream, upstream considerations of impoundment, uh, certainly flood resiliency. Up to this point, we have not counted phosphorus credits. Um, so this is a new uh, lens through which we are evaluating those uh, um, structures, but they do generally have improvements um, to the stream connectivity and that's where they would gain the phosphorus credits is really improving that long stream, you know, up and down connection with sediment and uh, flow transport. Um, some, some structures, um, there's a project uh, that we've been working with the, one of the conservation districts on where they're going from uh, eight foot culvert to a 30 foot bridge, um, which is able to accommodate uh, floodplain um, development. And so they will also, you know, have some phosphorus credits uh, around that additional floodplain uh, connection. So um, they can, have important clean water um, benefits, um, you know, as, as part of as part of their work. I'll, I will leave it at that. Thanks, thanks, Stacy, uh, Lauren. I don't know if at this point you want to try to moderate things, or just I can see if there are questions. There are some hands up, so maybe maybe it's just going to take care of itself. I'll let you run up the show. Yeah, thanks, Dean. Um, Alaire, I see your hand was first. Yeah, thank you to all three of you. That was that was really helpful just to lay out the landscape of culvert funding and how it works. Um, and I guess I have a bunch of questions. Some of them are just clarification. Um, so when you were just talking about the um, like the municipal grant program that towns can access, is that the Better Back Roads program, is that the same thing? I think I heard you say something about Better Roads or... Yes, um, it's actually now changed name to, uh, let's see if I can get it right. It's 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 the, it, the permit itself is the Municipal Roads General Permit. And um, that's the permit. The funding actually comes through VTRANS and... Um, uh, I don't work in that particular section, but I believe that it's uh, it's called um, Better Roads now. It used to be Better Back Roads, but I could. Stacy, do you know the the technical the the is it Better Roads? It it is. It's now Better, better Roads. Yeah. yeah. So they they it's not Better Back Roads. It's just Better Roads now. Okay. Better Roads grant funding and there's. There's, um, if you're familiar with that, there's several different levels of funding that towns can go after. There's uh, uh, different grants. Uh, I think it's B, C, and D, or I, I don't know if it's A, B, and C, D. I don't know if A is actually in there or not, but definitely D is like a $60,000 threshold. Now, um, uh, just, to, just to belabor the point, you mentioned funding. So, there's, I was, I was in, I was a fly on the wall during the voting of this year's uh, Better Roads funding. So uh, just to tell you, is there enough money? So Better Roads has a, 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 for the class D grant, 
It's a $60,000 max grant. Anybody want to take a guess at what the total pot of money is for the class D grants um, for the entire state? Well, 400,000. So you're not going to give too many $60,000 grants when the entire state has a pot of 400,000. So, um, right. So uh, you're, you, the, the, I think it's the class B, B grants are a $20,000 max. And I, I think there's like, I don't quote me, but I think there might be 600,000. So you can see that, you know, that 600,000, you know, can go a lot further, you know, at $20,000, a maximum, a pop versus, versus the 400,000 at the $60,000 max pop. Um, so is funding needed? That tells you right there <laughs> if we need some funding. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's that is that context is really helpful too, just like amount in terms of what amount of money is actually out there for those kinds of projects. Right. So what what yeah. it's interesting. I wasn't ever I'm not a voting member, but I was in on the I was in the committee meeting and when they were voting and what they were actually talking about was let's say a town put in you know, it, it, just throwing out a hypothetical here, but let's say they had a, a class D grant for 36,000. Um, you know, they, what they might do is they didn't have enough money in that class D grant. So what they did was maybe offer them a class B at 20,000 towards their $36,000 need. Um, but just as an example. Yeah, and those those amounts are not not huge in terms of doing a, a no, large no. Yeah. no, you're talking some pretty small work at twenty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Okay. Um and, and just my other clarification question is is um when you were talking about the hazard mitigation funding, um with that's fifteen percent of sort of the, the cost of the flood, is that FEMA funding? Um, yes, that would be FEMA funding and that, so there's a, you know, yes, yes. Okay. Um, Stacy might be able to answer the question more. I've, I've always been on the periphery of that funding and, and I, th I think it's administered by, um, by, uh, Ben, Ben Rhodes in Ben Rhodes in the, in the uh, public safety department. But ultimately, that is, you know, a theme, a pot of FEMA money. Stacy, do you know, can you help me out on that? For the hazard mitigation funds? Yes, yes. Yes, yeah, so that does come through the State Department. Um, if, of public uh, safety? Yes, public safety. Okay. Um, and those typically can be applied for uh, by the town. There is pre pre-disaster mitigation funds. So if you want to proactively repair things, um, and then there is, you know, the hazard mitigation funds that often are, you know, when you're in the repair process or trying to move forward. So um, those funds, um, I, I'll look quickly and provide the link uh, to, to that web page for folks to investigate. I've put a couple links in currently for the Better Roads grant. There is the VTrans grant and aid program. And then there is a nice document that uh, was released in January that's uh, show me the money um, that has a list of grant programs for municipalities for short bridges, culverts, and some other town related type of infrastructure. So, um, oh, I guess there's also the structures grant. So I will provide you one more link in there, um, but also the hazard mitigation web page. Um, some folks may have also heard about the flood resiliency community fund, um, which is another fund that is uh, going through our, our state's uh, hazard um, DEM, De Department of Emergency Management. Um, that fund, um, culverts have not typically been a high priority unless they um, are really um, showing a high flood resiliency benefit to the community. Um, you know, simply, simply recognizing um, many of the undersized structures could have some flood benefits, um, but 
um, that those those fundings have not been prioritizing culverts at this point, um, unless there's been a high flood resiliency, but um, hazard mitigation funds and things um, also can focus on that that level of funding. I just, you know, I just follow up with what Stacy. I just want to add one thing that um, all these, the the hazard mitigation is 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 a very good source, but it's also uh, my understanding in in helping and just 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 lending a hand and writing support letters. It's 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 not a slam dunk. It's it's there's a lot of work to it. Um, there's there you know engineering. You've got to hire an engineer. It's it's um, your technical proposals, your plans. Uh, so it, it's, it's not a fast moving process. Whereas the, uh, the better roads grant, um, is a pretty simple, you know, it's not a lot of money, but it's a simple application, uh, process. The, the town highway structures grant, um, it's not a huge pot of money. It's like a hundred up to $175,000 maximum. Again, there's, 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 I think about $600,000 district wide. So not, you can, you can already see that, you know, say there's 25 towns in a district um, or, or, or more, you you know, there's, there's no chance of every town getting $175,000 annually. So, um, but the point I'm trying to make is that process, that grant process is much easier. Um, the bars are much lower in terms of, in the hoops that you have to jump through are much lower than say the hazard mitigation. You, you can literally work on a hazard mitigation grant for years. You know, um, it would not be uncommon to, you know, it, as a matter of fact, it would be very common to, to work uh, a number of years to get a grant like that before it actually came to fruition. Whereas these other things are pretty much, you, you, you'll you know, um, you know, within a very short period of time after the grants close, whether or not you've been successful or not in your, propo in your proposal. And I just, just one final kind of clarification question. Patrick, you said that you were trying to get towns in your previous role to prioritize culverts. Um, and can you just say if that was, culverts for replacement, if that was through looking at the, just the infrastructure kind of stuff, like are they failing as structures in terms of a safety issue or road, like road issue or um, more of a river and AOP side of things like, and. And how many towns actually are, have done that? Like how, how common is that, that towns have that information? Yeah, I, um, I've, I've been an advocate of that for a long time. So it's a great question. Um, I, I, I was, I can't tell you how many towns have done it. Um, I partnered with a few towns that was done. Uh, so I was the engineer on, on the committee. Uh, Jim, Jim Ryan at the time was a watershed planner. Um, and uh, uh, Ben Copans was, uh, uh, Stacy, what's Ben's title? Is he a, he's a watershed coordinator, coordinator, coordinator as well? Yeah. Okay, he was on the committee and then we worked with, uh, we worked with the town of uh, Groton, specifically in this one instance that I'm thinking of, with the town road foreman. Um, with with the town and then uh, they they coordinated some with the with the select board um, on that endeavor and what we did was we pulled our resources together and looked at um, overall their entire culvert inventory and and the and then we kind of tried to pare it down to the the worst of the worst and and in terms of need um, and and that was more structural need um than it was anything else and and then then i came in as as well if this was culvert was to be replaced it's on a perennial stream we'd want it would definitely be an aop need to be an aop compatible stream and what i did was then took the top 10 and i provided a structure size um to to make it aop 
compatible as well as flood resilient. So I actually size the structures based on the hydrology and the hydraulics of the site as well as AOP and tried to provide um, uh, so a, 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 for their top 10 list, I tried to give them if if they won the if gotten won the lottery tomorrow night and they wanted to fix every structure, every poor structure in their town, you know, kind of a, a blueprint for what they would kind of put in the ground if 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 they had their wish come true. I don't know how many towns have done that. I've recommended it to every town. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, if I was to guess, I bet about 10% of the towns in the state have that list or a similar list. But maybe I'm, maybe that's pessimistic. I'm a realist, but that might be a pessimistic view. Stacy, what do you think? How many towns have a top 10 list in terms of need for, you know, do uh, you have any idea? I, uh, I would say, okay. oops, right, yeah, I got um, internet blip got kicked off. Um, I would agree that um, there's probably 20% who have that kind of list, although I would say, um, more active districts have been working with towns and um, through some of the prioritization efforts um, you know, may have been helping communities build a better list. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can say I know a handful of uh, the districts working in the Mr. School have been working with the communities, um, but, but how much they have already to list, uh, yeah, I, I would say probably not a large large of them. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you both. As, as part of that list, we actually just to further that concept. So we, we put a, a bare, a, it's a very simple a booklet together and, and, um, and basically talked about the watershed, the, the need, and then, and then kind of up what size structures uh, might be required. And then a, a up a snapshot in time cost estimate um, for how much it would be to potentially replace that structure today. Um, and that's kind of what's in that report in a nutshell that I was involved with. I do just want to note for the record that Karen Bates is here also. Hi, Karen. Um, all right, next question, Ted. Thank you. I have um, a question, then a comment. First question, in the Better Roads uh, funding or does funding packages through VTrans uh, be used to support engineer design, like project design? Um, uh, I think they're more implementation uh, grants. Uh, they're really looking for these projects are kind of sh almost shovel ready. Uh, the, the projects are pretty simple, Ted. These are, uh, you know, the mis I don't know if you've read the municipal roads general permit, but it's like um, d ditch stone, uh, uh, seed mulch, uh, ditching, yep. Yep. ditching efforts. Uh, New, new, new roadway, certain gravel roadway surface material, um, um, replacing, you know, you know, going from a 24 to a 36 inch culvert, you know, st stuff that, stuff that usually the road foreman and or road commissioner, um, with the assistance of maybe one of the engineers from VTrans districts can easily put together, a you know, a, a, a simple estimate and a sketch plan and, and they can go out to bids and or the uh, town can administer the, do the work themselves. Yep, um, very familiar with all that. My comment is uh, trying to get funding packages together for a AOP stream crossing 
is very challenging at best. We're looking on average, if you're doing an open bottom culvert, around four hundred thousand dollars <laughs> yeah. on average now. And this yeah. is looking across uh, what design work for the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, that said, uh, since I'm in charge of our conservation district and identifying culverts for replacement. I've gone from an AOP point of view to more of a holistic point of view where it's got to be AOP, but it's also got to do something for the community as well. Um, being flood resistant, increasing geomorphic connectivity, etc. That in mind, even with the phosphorus reduction calculator, um, even if you have a lot of influx of um, sediment and debris, that calculator still puts you at really low end. I've tried gaming it many times, uh, trying to get a bump in that. It's not happening. So I'm hoping that the floodplain, uh, floodplain functioning initiative tool will have some shed some light in this. But I think my cautionary tale here is that these culverts need to be part of a larger restoration project, like a floodplain restoration component that can involve the state or the municipality and local landowners. Um, that's where I'm coming to after only nine months in this position, but it's been a tough battle trying to just get one culvert in Westfield replaced. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would just, doesn't sound like you have a question, but I would just, uh, from a comment standpoint and an engineering standpoint, I would say that, um, and my my most recent decade was spent working in the Northeast Kingdom, um, or at least the last eight eight years was, and and prices after or or um, you know since uh, the uh, pandemic have have gone through the roof and the demand with all the federal stimulus funding, you know, for all the transportation agencies across the nation have pushed up the cost of culverts and um, structures such that, you know, what, what was 200,000 is now 300,000. With that has ca- come labor, et cetera. So yes, I, I, I agree with you. Um, one thing that one thing that that I think that uh, it can be helpful is that you you expand your your uh, contractor contact list. Sometimes uh, contractors are used to getting, uh, more money than other contractors. Some contractors are used to, depending on where you're talking about, some contractors are used to working, uh, unfortunately, for VTrans, and they think they, they pad their their price <laughs> because they've got to jump through so many hoops. Yep. Um, and so to look to contractors that do reasonable work but don't expect to you know, have the pot of gold get handed to them every time they do one project is, is probably what, what you're looking for. Yeah. Sound, sound advice. And yeah, my, I didn't have, I had my first question, but yeah, this was a general observation discussion point. (laughs) Thank you. Yep. Thank you both. Um, Kent. Thank you. Um, A situation that I've run into over and over again in looking at stormwater management uh, plans that we've written up for several townships over the last 10 years, we pick off the projects and work on them, but the ones that are left are these box culverts that are under municipal roads. And in order to save money, the uh, town to, to build the shortest culvert possible and spend the least amount of money possible, they build these things short and at 90 degree angles to the roads. And we've got several areas that this is causing serious stream bank erosion on both sides of the road. 
and we've we've demonstrated it and then when you go to the town and how can we solve this the response i've gotten is they dump field stone on the inlet side of that culvert or i've actually had them back up the cement truck and want to pour cement uh, around the inlet of that culvert to keep that improperly designed culvert in place and not address the stream bank erosion that's going on. So I guess my question is to um, Chris, and I think you had Jan on the line, and I'm wondering if redirecting, it, it's not just a matter of sizing these culverts, it's the matter of placing them properly. And of course, that's, that's a big construction project to do that. Um, I'm thinking, what is your thinking? Is that a regulatory issue or a non-regulatory? Should I even be investigating this sort of project? And I've got three of them. I've got three of them that uh, have not have received attention now for the 12 years since we do since we've done the studies. And there are certainly areas. Uh, I think I brought Stacy and Karen out to one of them, and uh, there there are ones that we're ready to identify if if. Uh, if we should even spend our time doing that. When it comes to project specific questions, I would definitely defer to Karen Bates as your uh, first point of contact. Um, you know, I can give you the general, I can just repeat the policy. If it's required maintenance, you know, um, it's gonna be regulatory. Um, I, I'm hearing there's some nuance in the project you're describing. And, you know, that's, I would rather Karen opine on that than than me. So it might, yeah, it might need, there might my be some aunt's, gray area. My aunt's great uncle constructed these box culverts 110 years ago. Wow. And, they're, I, I, and they're not going away. They're going to just stay right there. And the, the town's answer is if we can dump field stone in there and cement around the uphill side, we're good. And in the meantime, the stream bank is uh, being being eaten away and bringing sediment right to the lake. So I can I can add on to that. Um, I think I think you know because they're in the stormwater master plan doesn't necessarily mean they're a priority because as you said, Kent, the real issue is how are they affecting the geomorphic condition and are they adding instability downstream that is you know just unraveling than an area which is incredible amount of sediment. So I think that priorities for um, uh, culvert replacement should not be based on stormwater management plan, um, but whether or not uh, Stacy agrees that they have a substantial impact to the equilibrium of the stream um, or that it's identified in the stream geomorphic assessment. Because that's the only, that, that's how they, because as you said, the problem is how are they associated with the stream um, uh, the morphology of the stream and the st stormwater master planning identification and prioritization process only we looked at the erosion, you know, the visual erosion. So, um, and especially in Georgia, that was like a big focus of the plans. And we, we actually pulled the uh, consultants away from that area. I think after that one saying, no, we don't want you to be focusing on culverts. So they may have found some good ones, but they, we need a different way to prioritize them. I'll just chime in, Patrick Ross, again, I, just from a standpoint, it's good to hear that those are 100 years old. I was going to say, um, you know, uh, I, we've been sizing culverts now for about 20 years with bank full width and trying to get alignments uh, pretty, uh, you know, structures aligned with the overall stream. Now, that's not to say that sometimes, you know, alignments don't shift a little bit. So that, you know, I mean, you, you can easily see where a structure, uh, um, we were just talking about how, you know, a structure can be $400,000 pretty much in a hurry. So, you know, to align a structure or get the structure to be a little bit shorter and cut 50 or $100,000 off sometimes, but I, I'm betting that the structures you're talking about are not bank full width structures. That would be my guess. Um, Kent, but but just a guess. Yeah. 
All right, Sarah, I saw that your hand was up. Yes, um, and I'm probably the most ignorant of everybody on the committee, so bear with me. Um, when you talked um, about the reach in terms of that being something that we'd be using in terms of the culverts, is there a rubric on that? How do we assess that when we, we had two projects that come before us and how do we determine if it's appropriate when you haven't measured or phosphorus before in relation to this? How are we gonna make that determination? Sarah, this is Stacy. Um, so there's there's kind of two pieces to your your question. Uh, generally, we would look for our partner to collaborate with us, and we go and evaluate the sites together to consider what are the potential geomorphic or stream uh, impacts upstream and downstream of the structure, and how might modifying the structure um, reduce those potential impacts. So, for example. Um, I've, I've spent a day with Ted um, looking at some structures in the upper Missisquoi where there were some question, you know, was opportunity, um, you know, to, for potential clean water funding questions. Um, a couple of the structures we said, yep, these seem to meet because there's uh, additional sediment buildup upstream that's, that's happening quite a ways upstream. There's increase in erosion that's happening downstream um, that's that could be improved or reduced um, through improvement of the structure. So that's been a technical evaluation that we've done with our partners when we've looked at the structures. As far as phosphorus credits, at this point, we would be looking to use the functioning floodplain tool, which will be released later this summer. Uh, we're in the midst of, of, of gearing partners up through trainings on the tool. Um, so that will be provided later for folks to make a phosphorus kind of evaluation, um, which is one piece of the consideration of, of should or why a structure may be, um, you know, affected. Um, to Kent's question, you know, there are, especially older structures or box structures, those tend to be, um, have long lifespans. Um, when they were installed, um, how they were installed would could potentially affect um, what size the structure was or what um, additional um, uh, steps were taken to include aquatic organism passage or not, um, depending on, um, as Pat said, you know, it's, it's really been a focus in the last 20 years, but prior to, and Pat, please help me, was it 2010, um, the stream all engineers did not have jurisdiction over streams that were less than 10 square miles. Um, and so while there was some review, there are definitely, you know, more streams now that are under the focus of the engineers um, review and permitting. So when do you come back to an older, older structure and decide is it a, a cost effective and necessary project um, would be kind of looking at the comprehensive views of, you know, what is the overall goal? Um, is it just simply a realignment? And, and how does that affect the stream upstream and downstream? Does that provide the benefits? Um, should it be resized? Perhaps the structure that Kent and I looked at is not a bad size, but it just has a horrible alignment. Um, so maybe you're not trying to replace the structure. Maybe you're trying to dig it out and realign it. Um, what does that take as far as the stream you know, process? Um, so there, so Sarah, I guess that's not that's not necessarily a very um, succinct question or answer to your question, but um, those are the steps that we have up to this point provided um, for assistance to our partners, and we would be looking at right now, you know, trying to add in the additional phosphorus component. So a partner could come to you all and say, "Here's all of the benefits that we would see for the structure." and why we feel it is important for us to replace. Here's Stacy's technical input. Here's the stream engineer's input. Here's Karen's input. And here's the potential phosphorus. So it would be 
I would hope that you folks would receive a package from the partner that would help kind of lay out some of those considerations for you to help evaluate um, the phosphorus piece being one component of, of why a structure may be of a higher or lower benefit, you know, um, priority within the context of the formula grant, but those those could be laid out um, to, to, to help you all evaluate the overall benefits and needs of the, at the structure. Thank you. That's that really that's really helpful knowing that we should have, you know, evaluations from you and Karen um, to know how that this should be evaluated. Actually, I won't, I'm not part of the evaluation. Oh, so, okay. Because it's just the, uh, um, yeah. I, yeah, I, I guess, Karen, I, I guess, Karen, I put more in context of like the tactical base and plan considerations, maybe not, maybe not the site specific, but perhaps um, towards yeah. some of the goals meeting the tactical base and plan. Yeah, and those and the tactical base and plan basically says that it to focus on, um, make sure that geomorphic assessment um, supports the culvert replacement um, towards a, a better, equal, an improved equilibrium. And it, it says AOP is definitely something that should be improved, especially because a lot of the grants are for that. Um, are there are grants towns can get to support it because it improves AOP. But um, otherwise there's, there's not much more in the plan about um, supporting that provides additional information. So I mean, what's interesting about this discussion is that, you know, what is the role of the WIC in assessing which culverts should be removed and, and which ones are a priority because it's complicated. And um, maybe that would be the focus of, or the outcome of the discussion. Uh, because in my mind, it's, it's really just getting that phosphorus reduction no number and looking at the cost maybe over a, a couple of different types, a def, def, couple of different situations to decide whether or not it's even an area you want to invest a lot of time in because it's not a lot of a phosphorus reduction um, and then go into the co-benefits. Wonderful. Does anyone else have further questions about this? I, I just, I just uh, Pat Ross, I just had one other point. I. I I, I guess it's worth mentioning, and it sounds like it's already teased itself out a little bit, but one, one thing, Kent, Kent brought up the idea of these, these structures that he's seeing, what, and what we're seeing around the state, of course, is, is just the state of the infrastructure, um, and that there is such a need uh, just for safe bridges, right? Safe bridges and culverts that... Um, there, there may or may not be, uh, you know, bundles or overlaps here. Uh, there may be, and there may not be, and that m might take some teasing out. I, I can tell you just from a public safety standpoint, um, in the number of culverts that, that went in, in and around the late sixties, early seventies, as part of the, you know, state highway build, we, we've got thousands and thousands of, of culverts, big, big culverts that are in a state of disrepair with, with, with large holes along the inverts with piping um, fines and sinkholes developing that we're just, you know, we're, we're all scrambling to try to, to, to stave off the next kind of, um, I don't want to be a fatalist, but you know, d d you know, many disasters. So, so um, there's there's two two areas here. It's one the structural thing, and then it's it, the other one is the you know from where you guys are stand you know from trying to um, from a basin standpoint and water quality. There may, maybe there's some overlap, maybe there's not. So in terms of funding, there's definitely a need for added funding bottom line. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate um, all the folks who had some input for us. I know this is a big question um, that we're all kind of learning more about. Um, 
I don't necessarily have a nice way of wrapping this up. <laughs> Dean, I don't know if you do. Um, what I'm hearing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is it really makes sense, I think, for BWIC members to look at the culverts if you have another project going on as part of a bigger project, but maybe the culvert replacement in and of itself isn't necessarily a great thing to be looking at is kind of what I'm hearing. Um, and maybe we should be working with our towns some more to get them those prioritized lists. Um, I don't know if maybe that's part of project development, acceptable funding at some point, but maybe a question for a later date. Yes, a layer. Yeah, is this an appropriate time to just respond, like as a BWIC, just talk, think about this information and have some conversation about it in terms of how we apply it to our process or should we wait on doing that, Lauren? Mm -hmm. Um, I guess let's let's talk about it. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Um, a question for you. Uh, sorry uh, to interrupt you, Alair. Um, do you feel like you still need Pat or I for this discussion, or or do you have enough information for uh, from us to allow you to go forth and have some conversation? And if there's questions that come back, we can Pat and okay, I can continue to assist. Yeah. And I'll stay on. I think from from my perspective, I think we've we've had these great presentations and information, and everyone's asked questions. And um, I think, but I guess Lauren or Lindsay as the chair, vice chair, I think it, I, it feels to me like we can take this information and process it ourselves, and then come back to you both or or you three with other questions if we have them. Okay, then uh, if if unless there's yes. other questions or needs for me, I'm going to hop off. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you. I had thank one you. other. I had one other comment based on that, and then I'll leave. To I'll get off to. Um, but going back to my last point, if you take a circle of the culverts, um, if you if you put a circle around the the a municipality and their 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 priority list in terms of structural deficiency, and then you take, you know. Um, the, the basin's priority list and encircle that priority list. And then you merge the circles together and see where where the two you have interconnecting um, projects, probably that would be where I would start my focus. And because, because then you could maybe lump funding together to get the best result. Like you could go after town highways or a structures grant, you know, for a project that is in both of your area. The town is going to want to solve that problem. You're going to want to solve that pro your problem, the combined problem. It might be a good good way to kind of tie the list together. Just just my from from looking at these in different ways in the past. Pat, I think that's it's so funny when you started talking about a circle. All I did was I was I thought you were going to be talking specifically about like a culture. <laughs> I was picturing right. that. Um, I think that's really interesting. And it I I guess before you jump off, um, just to clarify, like it sounds like from what you were sharing, some of the yeah, I guess there could be some where there's an infrastructure issue and an AOP issue, but it sounds like though if there's an infrastructure issue, it's really a regulatory project. Um that would um, not be something I don't necessarily think so. I, I know okay. most of the projects that I get involved we get we get involved with with the towns are <clears throat> more because there's a maintenance issue that i'm working on one for the town of orange right now that i'm finishing this afternoon um and the bridge is just in a state of disrepair but it's not a regulatory there's no push to get this done they're just they're, they're it's on their critical list um whether they have a report or not it's on their critical list so um, and I'm going to send them back a hydraulics report on that on that structure. Uh, so I was just thinking if 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 you know some of those if the if there was an overlap in your circles of where you you know of your priorities, so your priorities lined up, that might be an area where where you know you you could just easily tap into that grant more of those grant fundings and solve uh, two you know two issues at the same time, right? Or three or four issues at the same time. I'm just gonna build on what Pat just said. Um, we have done that type of work in the past. Um, some of the corridor plans um, 
for streams that have phase two geomorphic assessment work, um, looked at bridge culvert uh, structures, some consideration with um, geomorphic and AOP considerations. Um, and then um, partners have worked with the towns to try to provide the town's uh, kind of priorities to see, you know, as Pat said, where, where is there some overlap or needs um, as a best way to figure out how to package projects. Um, again, it may be a structure that the town is like, hey, this is going to happen 10 years from now. It's in our priority of 10 projects, but it's 10 years down the road. And partners have found that the priority for uh, equilibrium or aquatic organism passage has raised it as a priority for them. Um, so they they begin to move the process forward and the town may um, contribute to in-kind or potentially other funds. Um, but it's not, but oftentimes, um, you know, it's, it's not a structure that um, I guess a layer can, you know, for, from a regulatory perspective is is necessarily like uh, we have to replace it today because there's a requirement to replace it um, you know they they overlap um, but but many times um, we're trying to approach projects with the funding at least when we've been prioritizing with communities like um, that it's not a project that is um, in their immediate maintenance or upgrade um, process such that our funding um, is um, uh, um, that's Not applicable. yes exactly yeah yeah now, I would just I would just echo and, and I think I'm hearing the question from Elaine as well in terms of I I don't see as I as I travel around the state and work with many of the municipalities I have rarely ever come across structures that are being replaced for a regulatory reason. I'm, I'm not a stormwater person, so I can't speak to that. So there's certainly cases where, you know, municipalities and or, you know, state VTrans needs to upgrade a, a structure for stormwater reasons. But most of the municipalities that I'm working with and uh, on uh, and doing assessments for their structures are just because um, you know the the structure is uh, is structurally deficient, and they're going to bring it up to current regulatory um, uh, meeting current regulatory requirements. Not necessary, so they're not being forced to do it. I mean, that would they, we, we we just don't have enough we just don't have enough public funding to go around to 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 make these things mandatory that they. They fix them all, you know. Um, I, I guess I, I hope I've made myself clear enough in that, you know, that that most of these are not being replaced for regulatory reasons that I'm aware of. Okay. Just to sorry, this might be a question someone else is going to ask, but just to clarify, so even I know we, we spoke about the MRGP, that is not a regulatory piece here? Um, the, the, the MRDP doesn't, isn't supposed to be looking at culverts where uh, streams passing through. Right. Gotcha. They're, they're in, intermittent streams, intermittent gotcha. streams, up to yeah. intermittent streams, not perennial streams. Um, right. But they're not, they're still not a like a, um, you know, they're, well, I guess, I guess you're right in terms of like that the regulatory uh, eventually uh, over the course of time, if, they've, if there's a problem, identified problem structure, they are supposed to um, upgrade the structure. And so I guess that, that is true. I, I'm, I'm incorrect on that, but, but I guess in terms of the larger structures where, where people would be talking a class D grant or a structures grant, for instance, um, maybe the structures that Kent is talking about replacing. Um, I, I don't know of any regulatory requirements saying thou shalt replace this structure. It's just when it's time, when, when the clock runs out on that particular structure, then you upgrade it to meet the current regulatory requirements. 
but there's no, as far as I'm, as far as I know of, there's no push to say, thou shalt fix this culvert and this culvert and this culvert in the town of St. Albans. Perfect. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Yeah. All right. Any more questions before we let Pat hop off? Okay. Seeing none, I'm sure we'll come up with some to send you, but um, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate uh, your expertise. Thank you. All right. I just want to do a quick layer before I say yes. Quick check in with Dean. We've got half an hour left. We've got a number of other things. I don't think they're going to take very long, but can you confirm? Can we have like 15 minutes for this discussion? I would like to have a minute to, to address project prioritization because it really fits hand in glove with this culvert conversation and then okay. maybe have the conversation that Alaire wants to have, if that's okay. If, that's, if that works for you, that works for me. I, I, I think so. Okay. Um, because some of what I think is being hinted at is, is um, it has been on our minds and is, is partially addressed. So I'm going to just bring this back. So uh, this may have been given a, a not very helpful heading of project prioritization, but we were the group was prioritizing projects at the last meeting, and there were some project applications that it was decided that we needed to continue the discussion later after there's more education about culverts. So um, that's what this first slide says. The motion was approved last time that said two applications we're gonna put off until there's a discussion of culverts. At one early point, it was thought that we'll schedule a conversation and then it's possible there would be revisiting of the applications. Well, what's happened is, is that at one of those applications uh, for some work in Westfield, this is the this is some of the field visit that Trace, that Stacy had referred to was, was, uh, was withdrawn at the request of the sponsor. So Ted could answer questions, but I don't want to put them on the spot. But the Westfield applications, that one's been withdrawn. So we go from two for consideration by the group to one. Um, the sponsor for the second application isn't here today. That's a project in Montgomery, but with the similar issues that were raised last time. What the CWISP is recommending is that when it comes to these types of applications, there's a pause until there's more clarity. And it's clarity about policy issues and technical issues. And you've heard about some of those and, and maybe, maybe also having to do with the funding issues. But as far as the policy questions, they include the cost of phosphorus reduction per kilogram and they also include another aspect of cost effectiveness that I'm, I'm gonna share in a minute. But we just feel like until people have a chance to use the FFI and we have a better handle on what phosphorus benefits will be for these kinds of projects, it's just not the right time to continue with an assessment of these particular applications. So we just wanted to Float that idea, the WIC could go ahead if it felt like it wanted to take action, but like I said, the, the sponsor of the application is not here. So it seems like it, a prudent thing to do is to not take any action on the remaining application. Now, you've heard specific, you've heard perspectives from particular people with particular roles in the Rivers Division, people at VTrans, people like Karen, Karen is kept, yeah, Karen still on. Um, I want to just emphasize there's there's going to be the BWIC thinking on this. There's also the QUISP thinking on this. And those, those two especially have to have a balance. And so what I'm going to show on the screen here now is that um, with, the, with these types of projects, we've heard a lot about the ecosystem function and how um, you really don't find attractive projects unless there's a larger ecosystem benefit. You can't attract the funding. 
I'm going to be tugging the wick in a direction that is rem a reminder. And the reminder is the QUISP's charge is to direct funding to projects that reduce phosphorus in a cost-effective manner. And this is just, you know, spewing out, saying we've highlighted this issue before. We've used examples of the average cost per kilogram, kilogram reduced. And it's still going to be important for the BWIC to keep that in mind. We didn't draw a line in the sand and say a specific cost was too much. We did say that a cost of two to three times the established or known reference cost really starts to move a project out of the area of acceptability. But we didn't draw that as a line. We brought the application to the BWIC, even though that had a very high cost. I can't say that that won't happen in the future. So I'm just saying that it's possible that the, that the QUISP at some point will say, we've received applications, but the cost per kilogram reduction are just too high and we, we don't even want to bring it to you. I'm not sure if that will happen, but it's a possibility. And the other way that I'm going to put this into context is that, again, given the mission of the QUISP to make reasonable progress towards achieving the phosphorus reduction targets, which in the Missisquoi is about 145 kilograms per year, and it, do it in a cost-effective manner, there has to be a balance. When we get an application, what percentage of our target is it moving us towards, and how much of the available funding would it cost, irrespective of all of the other benefits a project might have, if a project's removing two per, or it's helping us with 2% of the target and it costs only 1%, that's an easy project to say yes to. And these are just made up numbers. But if a project is going to help us get 7% and it's 18% of what we have available, we may be questioning whether or not it's an area that we should invest. And I think Stacy or somebody, maybe or one person earlier today was saying how maybe that's the conversation that the book needs to have. And, and that is, is this an area of projects or type of projects that should be invested in, or do we need to send a signal that it isn't? Um, that's okay. That's all I was going to say. I'm happy to answer questions, but maybe that can frame things a little bit differently or just be another factor in whatever conversation the group wants to have now. Thanks, Dean. Uh, Ted. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Dean. I like that perspective of the two examples going forward. Um, but I think when it comes to culverts in particular, um, I'm very interested in this FFI tool to find out how much that's going to help. If you just use the phosphorus calculator, uh, there's no way you're ever gonna get to that nice percentage, that nice balance um of cost per phosphorus having played with those numbers a little bit more thoroughly it's a tough sell <laughs> thanks ted um just a note for the record i did just realize i have not at all been saying all of the things that are in the chat um daya i wonder if those can end up maybe verbatim in the notes that go along with this recording. I sincerely apologize for that. Um, there's some good context in there though. Um, all right. Other thoughts on, I guess, just general discussion and then maybe we can kind of make a decision on this idea to pause on these projects and that should probably be a uh, motion at the end of the conversation. Um, it does look like Karen has a question. Ted, have you put any of your calculations on paper? Might be a good resource for others. Not yet. It's all done on a napkin, but I can move it to a spreadsheet. Yeah, awesome. you know, a tactical basin support grant task, maybe. Because <laughs> I, yeah, we could talk about it. Sure, definitely. Thank you too. Yes, Kent. Yeah, thanks. And thank you, uh, Dean, for that uh, demonstration. 
I've I've been thinking about that, and because our group has presented really expensive projects and really inexpensive projects, and I don't know how this is supposed to sugar off. We had talks about target formulations, and I'm wondering if you take those examples and if you take it across to the various target formulations and what we are expected or what, what has been laid out for us to use in our thinking in our watershed about how to be spending our money. Um, you know, there are some of these projects that just, they aren't gonna cost as much as, as others. Is there some way that that could be brought out against that? So we're sure that we're servicing all the areas in that target formulation process. And I'm thinking that, uh, you know, if there's 7% that is laid out there for assessments, those are not gonna, cost much per pound of phosphorus, but some of these where we're getting into the develop plans, we're gonna have some pretty high costs and I don't know how we're gonna avoid them. And I'm just wondering if that's another uh, part of this formula that we need to be thinking about. Thanks, Kent. Dean, I'll let you respond if you would like, or we can move on to Dan's question. Um, well, I'll just say that there's going to be a demand for, or people seeking funding for a range of different project types. Unless we pull the drawbridge up, I, I believe we'll see applications for all of the, the range of types. But from the standpoint of, you know, making the money go further, if the, if the CWISP in the book said, you know, listen, we're going to only focus on so-called river and projects, um, we will get more bang for the buck. But I, I don't know that that's a policy choice that anybody wants to make right now. All right, uh, Dan, go ahead. Well, it seems to me that uh, one way to deal with this is <clears throat> you go, depending on how much money you have, uh, you go through with the projects with get the most bang for the buck, and see if any money's left over or if there is enough you can fund this um, project that gives you the 18 <laughs> percent um the money not the money might not be there but at least if um it is then some of these less efficient projects could get could go through thanks dan thoughts from others <laughs> Yeah, Sarah. See, <clears throat> with everything that was put forth today, it seems to really validate what our concerns were the last time we met that um, particularly with the Montgomery project, the amount of money with the little bang for the buck on the phosphorus reduction makes me question the cost of these culverts that we can ever meet a target if we're using culverts. Um, and, and maybe it'll come out differently when this report comes out later in the summer, but right now it doesn't seem like any of the data is going to support us, particularly on what Dean had just presented, that it makes sense for us to even consider them. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. If I can just respond, the, the thing yeah. I would say is that the conversations we've had internally um, are something like this. If there's a if there's a decision made to fund a project that has um, relatively high cost compared to phosphorus, it's going to only happen once because what's going to happen is, is as soon as that project is funded, we're gonna show you a, a spreadsheet that says, if you ever do this again, it will be impossible to make the target with the money we will have. And so it's, um, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but well, yeah. So, so it, it's gonna be, if there's a decision that's made that something is, is that's um, not gonna perform well is still worth doing, the CWISP will have to clamp, clamp down because we have done, we've done some assessments and we are looking at this over different timeframes. But if you were to fund a project that doesn't perform well, 
it's just going to throw things off and, and we'll just clamp down and we'll say, well, from this point on, you, create, you can't fund projects that are any less efficient than X. Thanks. I do just want to note for the record that Kent has had to step away. I believe we still have a quorum just fine, but just for the record. Um, Alaire. Yeah, thanks. Um, Dean, I, I appreciated that, um, you know, the, the slides and the analysis you had and the suggestion of pausing around these projects. I guess my thought is, <clears throat> I think that you're you're describing kind of what we're already doing in terms of saying, you know, we, we really are kind of struggling with the other two projects that were presented in terms of the cost and the, the benefit, phosphorus benefit, knowing that the tool we had to calculate phosphorus is, is not great and that it will be getting better with the FFI tool. Um, I guess I would just say that I am not, I, I'm, I guess I'm, I can see both sides and I'm a little agnostic about kind of do we pause or not. I think that it could be totally reasonable to just say we can keep accepting these as proposals and then just keep deciding whether or not to fund them based on the calculus that you've provided and, and continue, continuing to remind ourselves as a WIF that we really need to be focused on phosphorus and cost effectiveness in terms of that metric. And so those kinds of projects can continue to come to us. And I think then we would just make a decision about do we fund it or not based on, on the analysis. And as the tool, the FFI tool comes into play and other tools are coming that, that might give us a better sense of what the phosphorus impacts would be, we just become that much more educated on that, the effectiveness of those projects. Um, on the other hand, I, I do see a value in like pausing right now um, and saying that to the, the project that's still out there, the Montgomery project, um, that we're not, I don't, I don't know if, we, if there's really a difference in saying, well, we're going to pause on this versus we're not going to uh, approve it right now. Or that sounds, maybe there is a meaningful difference there, maybe, and, and if there is, then we can discuss what's more appropriate. Um, but if we do do the pause, I guess I just want to, would want to have some more specifics around when do we release the pause? When do we, what do we need in terms of being able to like press go again? And just recognizing that the, the phosphorus calculation tool for all projects that are coming toward us is problematic. And we're a lot more likely to accept and fund, you know, ones that are, that just are lower in, in cost and seem to have more of a broad impact. Um, that's just, I think, more palatable for us all. And so just, just naming that, that I don't necessarily think, I think that we could pause or not, um, given the, you know, the value of the information and the thinking process that you shared, we should, we should accept that. Um, doesn't necessarily mean we need to say like we aren't going to accept proposals for culvert projects, um, but more like we just really need to meet these phosphorus goals, and we don't have great tools right now. And so if I, and and if we want to talk more about culverts, I can share the thought I was going to share earlier, um, just reacting to the information that we um, that we just got um, from our guests about what I think those projects would need to include in the proposal for us to be able to meaningfully consider them. I mean, yeah, I think go ahead, Alair. Okay, well, I was just gonna say that the, given the information that we got today about just the, the different streams of funding for, um, oh my God, it's so, it's so hard to not have a, a pun when you're talking about this type of work, <laughs> different streams of funding. Um, given the different streams of funding available for culverts and, and culvert replacements at town on town roads and state roads and so forth, and this this whole like network of, conversations that are happening in towns and with other organizations around prioritizing culverts. What are the, what's the need for replacing a culvert? Is it more from a, like the culvert is falling apart point of view or there's some sort of river or AOP consideration? I just think that we as a WIC need to have um, assurance that the project sponsor has explored all of the options and we need to see that in their application. So we need to say, okay, here, we're presenting this application. We have gone through this process. This is the number one culvert replacement priority for the town. And it's these reasons, and these are the people we've, we've talked to. We've gone for this grant. We haven't gotten it, or we have gotten it. And that's like, we just need to understand 
rather than just getting like a proposal that says we want to replace a culvert because it has the, the replacement will have these higher you know values um we need to understand more about all of the options and the just the landscape in which that particular culvert sits um and and what other funding possibilities are available to it and how much those have been considered um, I know I would want to consider that um, if we see just and, and simply for the reason that these are really expensive and big projects and so we need to have that level of um, information I would be more likely to support a project that has that doesn't uh, you know where the where the person hasn't explored those options and some of them may be available that shouldn't be on us to figure out that should be on them to show us I do wonder if um I don't know if it's DEC or Quis um could kind of take the information shared today by the speakers and turn it into some sort of like checklist of like oh did I check this funding source oh is there like a flow chart we need more flow charts <laughs> Um, yeah. And on that note, I do also wonder um, what other CRISPs are doing, you know, um, I wonder if they're running into the similar roadblock. I think we have the most money, so maybe everybody else has already just said to flat out no, um, but I would be curious if that is something we could um, dive into a bit more. Um, if, yeah, Dean. <laughs> I can just say that um, there weren't projects like this in Basin 5, and, and I'm on Basin 5, and um, Lamoille, there was nothing quite the same as this, so those projects have raised the same issues. Um, and then in, I've heard a report on from Addison on the Otter that their projects were relatively small, so I don't think they had the same issue but they, I don't think they had that issue either. That's just very, very quickly. But I'll get I'll get details and this idea of a checklist. Have you checked this funding source? Because it is it is a, a feature of the funding policy. You're not supposed to use QuISP funds when other funds are available. Um, and so this is something that'll get more formalized. Um, I am mindful of time. I just would say that theoretically 12 minutes left. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Yes, thanks, Dean. Um, I'll just say one more thing to you. I think a checklist too for like tree plantings would be helpful. Uh, I was just talking to Chris Smith earlier, and um, I think we just need more checklists for these projects. Or like, hey, there's all these things. Is the work the right place to bring it? Because it's not like we don't want these projects to be developed. It's just what pot of money does this go to? Because um, they're all good projects, whether or not they have the phosphorus beans. Yeah, you all know my thoughts. Um, Ted. Okay, last thought. You you brought up the idea of what are the other uh, BWICs doing. We're talking about this very thing in the Memphis Magog. Uh, so having sat on in this, I can bring that kind of information to them and vice versa, I can bring that back. And we'll have that discussion next week. <laughs> and I like the idea of checklists because now I'm going to include that in the how we evaluate some of the projects over in the month. Awesome, thank you. All so right. I, I just added that um, I think it, it would be, a, I, I like the idea too, and I, I've thought about it as well as being a good thing. And so Dean, what does it make sense to bring this up at an Act 76 meeting and maybe even have a pre-discussion with the other QUISPs saying, you know, you guys are supposed to provide us resources. This is a resource we need. Snaps to that, Karen. And not that we wouldn't need your help, but <laughs> definitely. All right. So 10 minutes. I think we need to make a decision to either not fund or pause on these applications. Um, if I can, oh, Dean, I see that you're talking and you're muted, and I'm certain sure it's important. You said plural, but it's one application at this point. Sorry. Great, thank you. Um, pause or not fund, I think are our two choices here for the Montgomery Culvert project. Um, do I hear a motion? I 
Dan, okay. I see your hand. Uh, I make a motion that we reject the project. We check the project? No, uh, turn it down. Oh, reject, got it. All right, Sarah. I second that motion based on the discussion we've had. Okay. And we weren't going to get any much phosphorus out. Okay. So, uh, Alaire, I see your hand is up. I wonder if we can um, share. Well, I don't, what's the protocol right now? To, I, to just I'm not sure. We'll have discussion. I think officially we're supposed to vote on it, but I'm not sure. So just go ahead and discuss. Okay. If we choose to reject it, um, I wonder if we should share with the sponsor that we would are working on our process and working on the tools and would potentially be inviting them. Like, like we would accept them re reapplying at some point with you know whatever we end up asking for. Okay. Kent. Yeah, and I'll just uh, say before we vote that I intend to vote against this uh, for the very reason that the layer just brought up. I think DEC has got some work to do um, on these P calculations and with us to become more familiar with the FFI. And so I would like to reserve judgment on the project until we've had a little more time to learn these processes. So that's why I will vote no. Okay, Dean. Not a member, just a technical point in the world that I lived in for many, many years, there's a concept of denying without prejudice, which means explicitly that you can resubmit. So that may be one way to navigate these shoals is that if the maker of the motion and the second seconder agreed that it was a denial without prejudice, that would telegraph that the proponent is free to resubmit. Or you could just, you know, um, do it some other way. I'll accept that. I will too. Okay. So motion on the floor, please correct me if I'm wrong, is a denial without prejudice and also providing additional information that um, to the project sponsor that the processes are being improved and things could change and here are kind of the things that we're looking at. Um, with that motion on the table from Dan and seconded by Sarah, um, all those in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. All right, I see Kent, Beth, Sarah, Lindsay, Alaire, Ted, Dan, Lauren. All those opposed? Seeing none. All those abstaining. Seeing none. Motion passes. Thank you all for your very thoughtful consideration of this project and this process. Dean. Um, I feel like I'm going to let you choose what we can accomplish in six minutes. Perhaps uh, put on a, a pause uh, until the next meeting to address public participation policy and instead talk about the annual meeting since the question that the group must answer is whether there will be a nominating committee because either the group says there's no need for a nominating committee and that at the annual meeting it will be an open process then and there. Um, or if there is going to be a nominating committee, then Lauren has to do it today. It's the bylaws say that it happens at this meeting. Um, that's the that's the foremost issue, and we can talk about the others later. But that's the foremost question. Okay, so there's either a nominating committee, or it's just like an at large. We all are in a room together and vote. Right, but for the latter to happen, there has to be a motion today that says no nominating committee, because otherwise 
you're supposed to create. Okay. Um, strong feelings either way from folks? I feel like a nominating committee won't come up with much different than just being at large. Okay. Other comment? Yes, yeah, Sarah. I think that we should have a nominating committee so that it is, you know, it's people who are educated, you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, and if we have to start over again, I feel like we're going to lose momentum. And I think it would just help the business meeting if we have a slate of officers. And that's how it's usually done in groups. So sorry, just to clarify, do you want a, a committee to determine who they want to nominate or do you want everyone to be involved in that process? I don't really care, but I think that there should be a slate presented to the group so that the business meeting of just electing officers doesn't take up a lot of time in the annual meeting. Okay. I, Dean. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the reason for a nominating committee is to accomplish what Sarah just said. It's so that it's it's clear there is at least a default position at the meeting and that you don't have to scramble. Okay. So I'm hearing both arguments. <laughs> um, do I hear a motion for one, I suppose? Okay. I move that we have a nominating committee. Okay. Thank you. I second. I second. <laughs> Sarah seconds. Ted agrees. Um, all those in favor of a nominating committee, please raise your hand. Sarah, Ted, Dan, Kent, Beth, Lindsay, the layer. Okay. Uh, Lauren, uh, all those opposed? None. Uh, uh, any abstentions? Seeing none. All right, so we'll do a nominating committee. Um, here's the fun part now, who wants to be on the nominating committee? <laughs> I can be on the committee. All right, Sarah. Dan, I saw you come off mute. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Lindsay, did I see your hand up? All right, Sarah, Lindsay. Any other takers? I feel like we should have at least three people on the nominating committee. I don't know if we ever said how big it needs to be, Dean, did we? I just wanted to say that, you know, the way the, the bylaws are written, it's really the chair's prerogative. You can ask for, for people, but this is an area where the chair has some discretion. So if you have two now and you want a third, then you, I believe you'd be free. You've done what the bylaws say, which is you said there's going to be a committee and you've got at least two members, you could be the third, you could choose, a three is a good number for a nominating committee. So right. you could you could choose the third or you could be the third. But I just you, would say that it is, you know, generally speaking, not a complete overlay of existing officers or okay. those who would serve. Okay. Can I get one more volunteer? I really don't want to pick on somebody and I cannot, I cannot do it. <laughs> There has been a determination made in the past, or at least a practice that alternates can also serve on committees. So maybe that's a practice you'd want to continue, just something to keep in mind. Kent, leave me on the committee. Thank you. Uh, my May looks ridiculous. So I appreciate this, you guys. All right. So it'll be Lindsay, Sarah, and Kent. Um, and Sarah, do you mind being the, the chair of the nominating committee? Yeah, I can. Thank you. All right. So Dean, I assume you'll communicate with Sarah about what they need to do? <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. All right, it's one o'clock. Anything else super pressing? Please, please share ideas for any speakers or topics you would like to address. And I do have another Zoom coming on, so I okay. would need to excuse myself shortly. But um, if you don't think you're going to end right now, 
they they will take the reins. I think we can end right now. Do we have a date and a location for this annual meeting? The next meeting, you have a date and a tentative location in Enosburg, but that's one of those other things that could be in play. But I'm looking for some spot like like Enosburg. Okay. So that will be an email conversation that we'll all be privy to. Yes. Great. Uh, all right. With that, motion to adjourn. Do I hear one? Mm -hmm. I see Sarah and Alaire and everybody in favor. Great. That's everybody. Enjoy May, everyone. Great job. <laughs>